Kansara. I'm an environmental economist, I run an architectural practice and I also run Replenish Earth Limited which is a, a company that looks prim primarily at the ecosystems um, and how the externalities of our lifestyles can have an impact on the global commons and how those global commons are governed, uh, what protocols and consensus are appropriate for the governance of that communal area space and planet Earth and what can we do to shift the way that we live but by looking at the philosophy around um, our systems and structures that, that we may sometimes feel are you know steady, never gonna budge but actually have a huge amount of potential to really challenge who we are as humans. Um, I often call climate change or climate crisis is an existential crisis because it's really about who we are as humans and how as humans we can really shift the way that we want to live in the future but often we don't think that that's even possible so how is it more possible to be so different and so much so much something else you know what is that something else who could we become so it's really a question of what would you like to be how would you like to get there? And there are so many other people around the world that are interested in doing something with you. You just gotta go and find them. So what is the recipe of change? What are the ingredients that we need to be looking at? If you wanna do something that can have a huge impact, what are the things that we need to be doing to, to encourage ourselves, not only to learn about who the others are that we're working with, but also how did these small shifts and changes have an impact on other people around the world? We want to dive deep into sustainability and really recognize what it means to be on this planet. So come and join me this way. Hi everyone, I'm Tia Kansara. And uh, today I want to share with you in my wonderful kitchen here in the Strand in London, exactly which kind of ingredients are really important for a sustainable way of living. You know, not that long ago when I was a, a wee little kid, one of my biggest challenges was not finishing my food on my plate. And my mum would often say, you know, there are people in India, that's where she comes from, there are people in India who don't get any food, so please finish everything on your plate. And I could appreciate that. It's just, you know, when sometimes you're really hungry and all you want to do is eat lots of food and you don't really consider that there is a person on the other side of the planet from Birmingham that would potentially not have any food. It just really didn't make sense. So when you think about these systems, you don't think how wide they have impacts and how and 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 you know how difficult it can actually be to be able to identify with the other. So one of the things that I learned when I was a kid, and actually just from my mom, was to do this very specific thing called gargasar, to have concern, and that kind of compassion and empathy towards the other has been at the, at the source of, of my learning. I can't say that I'm always perfect at it, but it's really fascinating for me to uncover that as I grow older. So who are these others and how do they have an impact on the way that we live? Well, you know, often we look at the planet as, as one body, a body in, you know, like a spaceship moving around the multiverse. One of the things that fascinates me so much is, is what the relationships of each entity are. And of course, one would almost often consider that we've got nothing to do with the birds. Why do we have anything to do with the bees? But actually, when you put them together, that's exactly the, the root of, of our being. We photosynthesize, and that photosynthesis of not only our own skin, but also the plant body, the agriculture and animal kingdom, 
all have a relationship with each other and it's by understanding these relationships that we can understand what the ingredients to success are. So often we look at these different aspects of the way that we live and we don't really consider how we could actually change the way that we live. Why should we change the way that we live? Well, you know, often we consider the consequences to certain situations, processes. And you may have a question about, hey, you know, if I were to do this, choice one, what would happen if I were to do this, choice two, what would happen, or choice up to ten, or whatever. But each choice has almost like that butterfly effect. Something on the other side of the planet shifts and changes. And to give you an example, David Attenborough's work in the environmental ecosystem and being able to identify and educate has really provided these incredible streams of relationships. So what do I mean by that? The ocean is a body of water on the planet. Each and every aspect of its ecosystem and food chain has an impact on the other. I was recently in the Antarctic and one of the things that we realised was that each part and each angle of the food chain coming from the krill all the way to the whales and then all the way to us has in one level or other amount of nutrient that is then passed on to the other. But with a break in that system, the whole food chain collapses. And so what we're realising is that there are different aspects of not only manifesting the sustainable way of being, but also looking at the step changes. These step changes have been occurring at really high speeds. Now one could say that they are anthropogenic and others could say that they're not. All we need to be concerned about is how can we live a better life, not only for ourselves but also for the others. Now coming back to the work that I've been doing for the last 10-15 years, almost 20 years with the regeneration program that I did in Digbeth in Birmingham, one of the core elements of my work is how can we replenish the planet. In other words, when I used to look at all of the graphs of you know, the economic demands and supplies and would understand or try to understand the consequences of our exchange around the world, I realised that it was rooted in a philosophy. The philosophy was of maintaining, keeping resources, certain resources like capital. This capital then extends onto the economy where market exchanges are created. That then sort of expands and then before you know it, you've got products, services in the physical built environment. What we live and how we are, what we wear, what we eat. So that consequence has an exchange point which has a philosophy. Replenishing the planet moves away from capital accumulation to identifying with the ecosystem. This is not about going to live in the forest and hoping that, you know, having lived an entire existence with technology, that it will be okay for us to live in the jungle. That is, it's not about going backwards, it's about including and transcending what we've done so far and where we're going to go. So it's a very simple structure. The three ingredients to changing the way that you live, look at the philosophy of what you're practicing. If it's capital accumulation or scarcity, you are going to be building an insecure system. And on top of that, if you have exchanges that do not value the other, you're going to be in a very complex situation. And thirdly, the ingredient to success is every manifestation is rooted in that philosophy. So if you want to shift that, you have to have an economic system that is rooted in a philosophy of living in harmony with nature. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that you don't have to compete. It doesn't mean that you can't create incredible businesses. It means that you develop a system that is aligned with your values. And these are, I hope, some of the values that you will enjoy just as much as I do. So imagine if you're a student and wondering, you know, I'm at school, I'm, I'm studying all of these things, they kind of make a little bit of sense, but what's the broad picture? And you're wondering, like, how can I really make an impact? Because ultimately, you know, mum and dad, like, rule my life, and otherwise the teachers rule the other part of my life, and, you know, whatever it is that I try to do, you know, it's never really good enough. So how do you go from thinking about this situation of the climate crisis as a as you being not big enough and not strong enough to the position where we kind of need you right now. Where do we need you? We need you to be thinking about the science behind it so that you really understand some of the facts that are happening. We need you to understand exactly how all of these aspects of 
the supply chain sort of logistically move together and the consequences of those, that's okay, that's easy. But what we really need you to do is to realize that everything that is has been given meaning from some other, someone, somewhere, somehow. Which means that all of that meaning has been assigned. For example, you know, if I were to, to grab a, a lettuce and a tomato, how do you know that this is called a lettuce and a tomato? Why wouldn't you call this the tomato? And the reality is that we've decided as a community of people that we're going to call this a tomato. Now, if you were, let's say, to decide that the avocado and tomato should be called something quite specific, you know, let's say you wanted to make a beautiful guacamole from Mexico and you decided that you're going to put some tomato in there, why is it that we've decided to call guacamole guacamole? We could call it avocado tomato sauce. But the reality is that whoever has the meaning that, that makes the most sense, and that's really senses of sense, is the one that's going to go the furthest. So for example, if something makes the most sense for you, because it's easier for you to do, then of course you're going to do it. Let's say you're cycling down the road and you see somebody that's eating a piece of chocolate, and you're thinking, well, why are you eating something that is super high amounts of calorie, a, a quick fix, you know, huge amount of sugar, and consequences are profound, you know, in your health and, and also the level of your concentration. But for that short period of time, that will do. Now, we've been in that mode as a society for a really long time. For a short period of time, that will do. Mostly post-war, because that's exactly when we started to start spouting that we needed to have one of everything. You need to have your own air conditioner and your own heater and your own TV, because during the war, that's not what they had. During the war, there were you know, little tickets that you can go and have food stamps with, and you had to go and get things quite specifically not available to you. Your lifestyle was way more constricted. So post-war, there was a huge boom because all of a sudden everybody could have anything that they wanted. Now, that short-termism has led us away from realizing the consequences of what meaning we're creating for our own lives. And if there's one thing that you can do, it is to build the own, your own meaning, your own core values for your own life. And this really digs much deeper than what your teachers are going to be telling you, what your parents are going to be telling you, because this is your own journey. And as you grow and evolve into your being, you will be able to recognize what meaning you're going to give to any of the ingredients in your life, because that meaning is at the core of what you do next. And if and when that meaning is shifted, and if and when that meaning is shared, you'll be able to create not only something for yourself, but also for others, and that's where the key to society really does exist. What meaning do you want to give to your life and how do you want to do that? Often I talk about mining, as in mining your resources, mining the resources of the planet. But ultimately what we've been doing is mining the resources of you as a person, giving you a very specific journey in your education system, allowing you to get a job, remember it's allowing you not giving you the opportunity to do what you want, but it's allowing you to get a job and having a very specific relationship with the economy because that is a system that has been created. And if you want to move away from that system, you need to go deep into that system and realize whether the values of this system are aligned with you. And if they're not, you need to start practicing your own practice of economic structures because every time you spend money, you are effectively investing in that system on a broader scale. Every time you study something, every time you spend your time or any of your resources on this, you are effectively feeding into that system. So you are feeding into the food supply of the entire structure of society. And I love what Buckminster Fuller used to say, and that was, if you want to change the system, you don't work by that system. You create another system. You create change by developing another system that then allows this one to become obsolete. But where's that point where this one becomes obsolete? And you can almost see in society today, people are still holding on to things. People are still saying, well, that's the way that it's always been. But that question is no longer relevant. Is that the way that it should be? And the answer is no. So imagine if you came across, you know, an apple that resisted being an apple. 
Or maybe if you came across an avocado that decided it was just not going to do the job of an avocado. And besides, you know, you were thinking, how in the world can I work with these people? You know, because they just don't get it. They don't understand what I need. They don't, they just can't figure out what it is that I want to do. And um, so, so what would you say were the steps to try and understand them? You know, there's a beautiful um, system called direct democracy and it's really the line of terrorism but it's fascinating because it starts from not being heard it starts from a person not feeling as if they're not being heard and they feel as if you know somebody is actually ignoring them and that part of being ignored is that the the feeling of isolation and I feel quite deeply that a lot of us feel quite isolated in the ability not to challenge those that don't want to res that they just don't want to you know even question and open up the, dis the discussion about sustainability. So, you know, we're territorial, right? So, so actually one of the things that I find in, you know, in life is that if you really want to create the kind of change that you need in your life, then you're going to have to start somehow creating either a path or some level of territory that makes a lot of sense. So, for example, let's play here with some food. Let's say you've got a, you know, the, a structure, like a building, that was constructed a long time ago and has a huge amount of significance to all of us. Let's say it was Notre Dame. Notre Dame, not that long ago, um, had a fire. And in the fire, it, um, it lost its roof. The wooden structure fell apart, and now there's tons and tons of this incredible amount of dust that's actually inside Notre Dame. It was a structure that was known. It was a structure that was identifiable by the Parisian people as something that had been there for the whole of their living history, right? Their whole, like everybody that's alive in Paris at the moment, everybody that's alive in France at the moment, they have always lived with the knowledge that Notre Dame was there. That is a known piece of information. Now, that structure burnt down. And before you know it, now there's a big question about what to do with it. The reality is, do we go back to where it was or do we have an opportunity to, f to, to change it? So at the moment, my business partner, Dr. Rod Hackney, is designing the competition for the Union of International Architects for that scheme. The reason is that if you look at that structure, and let's say you've got like a little bit of it kind of like, you know, broken off, what do you do with it? You know, you've got like a whole architectural structure that is uninhabitable at the moment. So how do you decide that you want to change it? Do you just try and find a piece, put it back on and voila, which is such an amazing opportunity to include, but transcend what it was. Not only because the time that it was constructed, you know, 800 years ago, is not the time now. We've changed in the 800 years of that history. So how do we make it applicable to today? Let's say the tomato is today. How do we make this applicable today? And I think our big challenge is, despite the fact that these structures still exist in society, we need to know exactly where that change and shift can occur. But these moments of change are so small. There are opportunities that are so short. And if we miss it, then before you know it, that piece of Notre Dame will be back again. And whatever behaviours that there were before and whatever meaning there was before with Notre Dame will remain and will continue. So there's an opportunity to, to completely shift the way that something is, is designed and to shift the way that something is experienced for who we are today. And ultimately, we are change agents. The whole of our body is changing all the time. You know, our cells are changing, the seasons are changing, and no season is the same. You know, the winter last year was not the winter this year. Every seasonal change, every change dynamic is very core to our being. And so why is it that we resist this change? One of the reasons that we do that is because we're afraid of what it can be. We're afraid of what it can be to become something that we've never known before. And yet, we are the experiments of the planet. Every single one of us is a face of the planet. And every single one of us is an extension of what that experiment is. So bringing it back in, timing is important. The ability to know exactly when something can actually change, shift and move on is important. And to strike when the tomato is hot.
say, you know what I say? I say, keep calm and carry on.